five of the series, Functional Theology, Functional Theology. What we've uh, discovered is that we've been looking at theological principles that really uh, explain our faith. And I said, I've been saying this uh, from the beginning of the series, that if you can't explain your faith, then you probably can't maintain your faith. If you can't explain this God stuff theologically, biblically, then you probably can't maintain it. And sometimes we come to church not even knowing what we believe and just trusting what every like leader or pastor tells you. And what we've been doing, we've been investigating the scripture to see who our God really is. And I just pray that this series has been a blessing to your life. And really you got some theological concepts that not only is just head knowledge, but just heart knowledge. In fact, we call this series Functional Theology. Because by the way, how many people know that the greatest theologian is Satan himself, right? So Satan knows theology. Satan knows his stuff. But functional theology is when your theology makes the long journey from your head to your heart. Right? And so we've been uh, in this series, and I'm looking forward to today's message because I think that if you get today's right, there's a lot in your life theologically and your view of God changes. And so I just pray that this is a blessing to you. I do have a scripture that I want to read to you. I found in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. This will be our foundational text today. And uh, we will look at some other scripture as an addendum to the text. Here we go. Um, verse 14, it says this. For those, of, for those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are children of God. And the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but rather the spirit you receive bought you about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. And verse 16, and the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in the sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I'm excited about it. I'm going to read that just one more time. Uh, verse 15, it says that the spirit you receive does not make you slaves. So if you walked in here feeling like you're bound to religion, this is not the faith in which we have because this is not about, about you being bound to religion, but this is about you getting set free and you knowing that you have been adopted into a new family. Father, for the next few moments, would you speak through me and to your people? And would you allow us to hear your words so clearly in Jesus' name? And everybody said today, amen. Awesome. Well, I am, uh, I pray that this sermon series has been a, a blessing to your heart. I'm, I think it's coming to an end. Uh, the Lord keeps like, you know, reminding me of other things to, to share uh, in this sermon series. But today I want to talk to you uh, about the doctrine of adoption. The doctrine of adoption. And what I mean by this is that we all have been adopted into the family of God. And so I want to kind of break this down, what that means for our lives and, um, and how we can apply to our everyday life. I really think it's going to be a blessing to you and it's your, your worldview towards God today. Uh, now, uh, just to kind of as introduction, um, I, I want to kind of just kind of set the stage. The book of Romans is, you know, what I call the constitution of the faith. It is, if you were to lock me in a prison and the guards told me that you only can choose one book of the New Testament to choose from to read every day, uh, most people probably would choose the Gospels, and rightfully so. You get an encounter with Jesus, and you get to see his love for the world and how he died on a cross for you. And most people probably uh, wouldn't choose Revelations, but um, uh, very few people would choose Romans, and I would choose the book of Romans. Because the book of Romans is the, the constitution of the faith. In fact, if you want to know um, what we stand on theologically, uh, the book of Romans represents almost 80% of the theological principles in which the Christian faith adhere to. And so uh, that's why I love the book of Romans. And the, the Apostle Paul, 
in the book of Acts, he planted a church. He started a church in Rome, and Rome was a thriving area, thriving city, although it had an aggressive military culture, aggressive government culture. And Paul was writing this letter uh, to encourage them and to remind uh, the people of Rome about these theological principles that they should be listening to and making sure that their lives are not living any other way. And then he's given us some good principles, and we all know Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3 talk about salvation and the road to God. Romans 4 is about the theological principle. Romans 5 is about combination. I mean, it's just just a great book. And then he gets to chapter 8, and he just throws a major curveball to the Romans that was reading this letter. He tells them, hey, and by the way, you all have been adopted. And that was like kind of a, a, a curveball that we've never seen before. Like we've never seen this concept of adoption before. You know, in the Gospels, we see concepts like freedom and getting set free. And even in the Old Testament, we've never seen the idea of adoption. And so when we see this word that Paul uses to the Romans, it's like almost like, hey, what are you talking about? You mean the God who spoke the world into existence wants to adopt you and I into his family? And the Romans are like, man, this is a scandalous faith in which we have because the the Romans were familiar with the adoption process that Paul was talking about. You see, you and I, we're familiar with the American adoption process where a child is selected or adopted by a, 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 a parent and uh, they come into our family. But in, in, in the Roman culture, it was a little bit different. In the Roman culture, what they would do is a judge or a master or a leader uh, will be approached by an adoptor. Uh, a, a father who wants to adopt a son or a daughter. And, 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 and the, the, the adoptor, that father would say to the judge, hey, I want to adopt a child. So what happened in that culture is that they would call about seven citizens out in the, the market, right? And so this is not like in a quiet courtroom where there's no distractions and there's all type of security that you got to walk through. No, 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 no. This is like lots of noise going in the background, lots of trade happening and, and lots of things happening. And, and while in the middle of the market, this judge will call to order a court session. And what happened in this court session is the judge would literally hit like this wooden thing and he would go and in that that was a sign that a legal process is about to happen and then what he would do is that he will he would hit the gavel and and once he hit the gavel that was a sign something legal is about to happen a transaction is about to happen So as a result, what would happen was the uh, judge would say to the the father who's about to adopt the child, hey, what what is your purpose? And the father would say, hey, I want to adopt this child. And then the judge would say to the child, are you willing to be adopted? So this is why in that culture, they didn't adopt babies uh, or they didn't adopt anyone younger than the age of 10. Here's why. Because the child had to be old enough to agree with the adoption. And so the child would tell, the the judge would ask the child, are you willing to be adopted from this family to this father? And the child will simply say, I am willing or I am not willing. And if he says, I am willing, what will happen is the father will have all this money in his hand and he will pay the debt of the child's original parents in order for that child to be coming to his family. And so what would happen is the judge would then say to the child again, are you willing? The child would say, I am willing. And the judge would hit the gavel. And when you heard that sound, it was a sign that that child is no longer a part of his old family. He has now been adopted into a new family. 
And what that ransom that that father paid is the ransom that our Savior paid on our behalf, that he paid the debt on our behalf so that you and I can be adopted into the family of God today. Just want to let you know that's why we kind of celebrate Easter and celebrate the risen king. Here's why. Because that was the payment that God paid on our behalf so that we now can be into his family today. This is the, the theology and the doctrine of adoption that you and I have the access to be adopted into the family of God. Now, real quick, I want to give you some um, some theological principles that lead up to the idea of adoption. The first is this. It's this word that is used. It's called regeneration. Regeneration is when God gives your spirit life. We were all dead in Christ, and literally it's like he gave us a shock to our spirit system and says, come alive. That's what you call regeneration. Secondly, we have sanctification. Now, sanctification is the process that happens after salvation. And what sanctification is this, God is going to clean you and make you right with God. Now, sanctification is not salvation. You see, many of us think that when we get saved, our lives are going to be perfect the next day. But how many people know that is not the case, right? We still got issues. We still make mistakes. We're still sinning. And sometimes in the church, when we see people who've made salvation commitments and they're still struggling, we say to them that they're not really saved. Well, that's not really the case because sanctification is saying that God's going to work with you. God is going to clean you over time so that you can experience and be like Christ one day. And by the way, we never leave the process of sanctification. We never get to the place where we have it all together. And when you find yourself at that place, that means you need to start all over again. Come on, somebody. What it means is that sanctification is this, is that when we say yes to God, it's almost like you got free from Egypt. Now sanctification is getting the Egypt out of you. That means changing your language, changing how you talk, changing how you think. That is what sanctification is. And by the way, if you have not walked through that process or not walking in that process, it is time for you to get in the process of allowing the Holy Spirit to change you from the inside. So we, we have regeneration, sanctification, then we have justification. Justification is when God gives you a legal right standing before him so that when God sees your life, he doesn't even see your life. He sees Christ's work on the cross on your behalf. And so now you have been called righteous to God because of your right standings with God. And that is really amazing, by the way, that when God sees you, he don't see how you've been stuck up, mean, moody, up and down, mean to people, backbiting, gossiping. He don't see none of that stuff. When God sees you, he sees the perfect work of Christ on your behalf. So that's why he called you and I righteous and holy, not because of what we do, but because of what Christ did on the cross for us. That's justification. And now we get to adoption. See, adoption is the act in which God makes us members into his family. We have been adopted into Christ. And that's an amazing testimony to share with the world that we no longer have to say that we are orphans, but we can say that we are kids of God. And just real quick, I know that we live in a culture where we say that the majority of the, the world is we're all God's kids. And I, and I get that from a general sense that we all have been created by God. There is no way that the way that our body works, our anatomy, our biology, to how we, we, our body works, there's no way that we don't have a creator. So I get in a sense that we are all kids of God. The whole world is kids with God. But that's not what the New Testament defines as a child of God, by the way. Not everybody has access to what you and I have access to. Like we, not everybody has the father, can call Jesus and God their father. That's not for, reserved to the whole world. That's reserved to those who says, I am willing. For those who walk through the process of adoption in Christ. And so I want to real quick talk to you about three different ways and benefits of adoption that you and I get access to. And it is so amazing. The first is this. When we get adopted into Christ, we are now led 
by the Spirit of God. We are now led by the Spirit of God. And can I tell you that when you now become a son or a daughter of God, you are no longer driven by the culture or driven by making money or driven by American success. You are now driven by the Holy Spirit. That is what drives you to go to work. It's what drives you to be a great spouse. It what drives you to be a great student. It's what drives you to be a good worker, a great parent, a great son or daughter. That is what drives you. And if anything else outside of the Spirit of God is driving you, it won't last long. So the reason why people of God and that we live not as orphans but as child and sons and daughters of God, here's why. Because we are driven by the Spirit of God. And can I tell you, when you are driven by the Spirit of God, you can go to work and your boss treats you bad and you still work hard. Because you're not driven by the approval of your boss. You're driven by the Spirit of God. When you're driven by the Spirit of God, your spouse cannot treat you right, and you still show up and be faithful. Here's why. Because you're not driven by the approval of your spouse, but you're driven by the Spirit of God. When you discipline your kids, you still can discipline your kids, and they get mad at you. Here's why. Because you're not driven by the opinions of your kids. You are driven by the Spirit of the living God today. Can I tell you, when you are driven by the Spirit of God, you show up every day with hustle and work and with drive, knowing that something outside of this world is driving you. The question today is, what is getting you up every morning? What, what is driving you today? Because can I tell you, when you are driven by the Spirit of God, something changes in your life. I like what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, NIV version. It says this, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are now children of God. Can I tell you, we need to be driven by the Spirit. And by the way, some of us need to quiet our soul so that we learn how to hear the Spirit's voice in our lives. Because by the way, he is always talking to you. He's telling you, don't say that. Don't go there. Don't listen to that. Don't engage in that relationship. Hey, girl, I, I, know, you, I, I know he look good and handsome, but I'm giving you some red flags right now. And some of you are ignoring the Spirit of God's voice. And can I tell you, when you are a child of God, you don't ignore the Spirit's voice. You lean into it and you quiet your souls daily knowing that he is always directing you and driving you somewhere because we are driven by the Spirit. And by the way, if the Spirit is driving you, he always takes you to God. So today it's time for you to Allow your emotions to leave outside of the driver's seat of your soul. Today, it's time for you to allow your circumstances to leave out the driver's seat of your soul. It's time for you to replace your emotions, your feelings, your desires with the Spirit of God and allow him to take the driver's seat of your soul. And he will always take you to the same place. And that is to healing, reconciliation, restoration, freedom, and most of all, God because that's where he takes you. The second point I want to make today is this, is that not only are adopted kids that we get a benefit of we're led by the Spirit, but secondly today, adopted kids have a benefit that we don't have to walk in fear. When you are a child of God, you no longer have to be afraid. You can walk in a confidence knowing that your God is with you. You can no longer walk in a sense that you have to prove yourself to God because no longer are you walking in fear. And by the way, I was trying to figure out what is the opposite of fear. Is it joy? Uh, Is it confidence? Uh, What is the opposite of fear? Like, what is it? And then it hit me. The opposite of fear is acceptance. It's when you accept what God is doing for you. It's when you accept knowing that no matter what hits you, God's going to work it out. It's when you accept knowing that no matter what the unknown future looks like, what your unknown relationships look like, it's when you accept knowing that our God can work all things together according to those who love the Lord. Meaning this, it don't matter what you're walking through. It don't matter what your past looked like. It don't matter what your current circumstance looked like because when you 
walk in acceptance, you accept that God takes all things and work it for his good. Come on, somebody. Now, that's good preaching right there. That's a little bit of a Presbyterian chap. What, what, what I'm trying to say is that when you walk in acceptance and, and you live from a place of not approval for, for God's love, but you walk from a place of acceptance, I've been accepted by God. He selected me as one of his kids, and he's adopted me into his family. That is a game changer. It sets you free from fear. Look, 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 what, look what the Scripture says in, in Romans, uh, the Scripture that we read. It says this, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again, but rather the spirit you receive, it brought, you, uh, brought about your adoption to a sonship, meaning this, that when you are a son or daughter of God, you no longer have to walk in fear. And I feel like a lot of you are walking in fear of the unknown, walking in fear of what God ever provide, will you ever get set free from this circumstance? Some of you are walking in fear, and God said today, it's time for you to be a son and daughter. And sons and daughters don't walk in fear. I remember growing up, um, my, my, my mom obviously made us take the garbage out. And we had like this little drive, long driveway, and the garbage was like on like the side of the house. It got really dark. I, alleys, I lived in Miami. The houses were kind of close with each other. And so it was real scary. And it was during that season where Freddy Cougar was out. Y'all remember Freddy Cougar? I mean, Freddy Cougar would, would, would do his thing. I, I, I was afraid of Freddy Cougar, but who I was really afraid of growing up was Candyman. Anybody remember Candyman? <laughs> All right, y'all don't know about Candyman, but Candyman, if you said his name three times, Candyman was going to come to your house and he was going to kill you. And so whenever it was my turn to take the trash out, my brother would shout from the window, Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. <laughs> And I would walk so all scared. I would run to the, the run to these trash cans, drop the can, and run back. And I would be so afraid. Literally, I literally thought that Candyman was coming to kill me. And one day I just realized, I said, why am I so afraid of Candyman? And so one time my brother said, Candyman, Candyman, Candyman. And I stayed there. I was afraid. I was like, I'm going to die tonight. But guess what? I'm going down happy, y'all. So anyways, I remember my, my, my you know, it was, it was Candyman, Candyman. And he didn't come. He never showed up. So I came the next time, and Candyman, 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 where you at, Candyman? And I accepted that, hey, I'm going to die. It's all good, right? But guess what? When you live from a place of acceptance, you no longer walk into fear because here's some of you, you are living from a place of approval and trying to gain God's approval. But no, God tells you today, you have been accepted. Yeah, 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 good. Acceptance is amazing. Because you accept whatever the future has, you know that your God is sovereign. And he spoke the world into existence, so you no longer have to worry about what the unknown future is about. Whenever you accept what happened in the past, you accept that God's going to use your past for your, your glory and for his glory. We see this in Romans, the same verse, the same chapter, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 28, that he works all things. Meaning this, we can accept the unknown future knowing that our God is for us. And some of you, you're not living. Living from a place of acceptance, you're living from a place of approval. And therefore, you're trying and trying. And God says to you, just accept it, knowing that your father, he has your back today. I, I, I want to read to you this one verse that, that I, I, I just love. And, and, you know, it just really uh, encourages us. It says this, that we, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, there, uh, there is no fear in love. But perfect love, what does it do? It drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fear is the one who is made in perfect love, meaning this, is that when, when you live from a place of love and acceptance of your father who has adopted you into his family, you no longer have to walk into fear. And some of you, if you can be honest, you walk in here scared of something. And God says, just accept it. No matter what's going to happen, God's going to use whatever it is. And I just, as a leader, as a pastor, I get, you know, I got to make hard decisions all the time. Hard decisions all the time. And sometimes I would be afraid of what people would think, how they respond. And even as a leader, and all of you are leaders, so you know that life is hard. And sometimes we got to make hard decisions. And as a result of that, we can live in fear of the opinions of people. And when you get set free, that I have been approved and accepted by the one so even if there are times where you don't approve of me, there is a God in heaven 
who always approves for me. And even when you see me at my lowest, the God of heaven always approves for me. And guess what? There is such a confidence knowing that even if I let you down, I can never let him down. Here's why. Because he constantly says, son, I approve of you. Son, you are now my child. And some of you walked in here thinking that you're not the child of the father because of your actions and can I tell you, you are a child of God. And by the way, since we got about 15 minutes and 32 seconds left in the service, I want to real quick let you know that I'm going to talk about something controversial. Can I, can I go there real quick, y'all? Y'all okay with that? Can I, can I keep going? And how some of us, how we think that, you know, you know, you, you heard of the term that we can lose our salvation. So some of you are afraid that you can lose like your status with God. And, you know, we read verses like uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22. It says that, the, that, that those who endure to the end will be saved. Or the scripture that says that when your name was erased from the book, the Lamb's book of life. And many of us theologically think like, oh, am I going to lose my salvation? Am I going to heaven? Uh, am I not? Can I tell you the adoption process in the Romans, it was unreversible. You couldn't go back on it. So can I tell you, we have made salvation in American uh, society so easy that all you got to do is raise your hand and you're saved. Well, that's not really salvation. Salvation is this. When you say to God, God, I approve of this adoption, and I'm leaving my old family behind, and I'm walking to my new family. So because we have made salvation so easy as, a, easy as a raising your hand, as a result of that, we have what we call a lot of false converts. But can I tell you, when you are a real convert with God and the adoption process was legal and it was legit, here's what happens. It don't matter if you walk away from God for a season. Guess what? Real sons and daughters, they always come back home. Read the prodigal story. The prodigal son, he took his, he took his father's inheritance and he went out. Most theologians says that it was about four to five years that he went out and lived a wild lifestyle. I mean, he was anti-God, anti-church, anti-his father, spent all his father's money. But even while he was gone, his father called him his son. And guess what? When you are a real son and daughter of God, you can walk away, but real sons and daughters always come back home. This is a God that we serve. And sometimes we can live a life knowing and having fear like, oh, my God, is my salvation legit because I slept around last night? And yes, God's saying you need to get your life together. But can I tell you right now, you don't have to live in fear anymore. Here's why. Because your God says you have been adopted into my family. You no longer have to worry if he's your father or not. He doesn't change his mind. He just unreversed that. Now, there are people who made that decision, and they really didn't, wasn't really serious about it. And for those of those, those people who never really went through the adoption process. You know, the Bible says that there's wheat and tear, and how there will be wheat and tear. And, and over time, you will see that wheat and tear looks the same for a season. But, you know, over time, you will see that the wheat and the tear, when it's full grown, looks completely different. And here's what God is saying to us, is that when you are truly a son and daughter of God, you always come back home, but more importantly, he always calls you his son and daughter. That is amazing. And when we read scriptures like the Lamb's book, uh, our, our name's been erased from the Lamb's book of life, or uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, when we read scriptures like that, that is not referring to salvation. That is referring to God exposing those who were false converts. And so can I tell you right now, for those who made that choice to follow God, you're in this family. Hey, I, I want to I finish uh, my last point. It's not only the benefits is that we get the Spirit and we're led by the Spirit, and also we don't have to be fearful. We can live from a place of acceptance with God. But lastly today, I want to talk to you about what it means to be co-heirs with Christ. Whenever you say yes to God, guess what? You now get what Christ gets. And this is the scandalous part of this particular passage of Scripture. And this is the part where I kind of question God. I'm like, God, this, is, this can't be legit, God. This can't be legit because here's what it says in verse 17. Now, if we are kids of God, then we are heirs, heirs of God. And here's what it says. We are co-heirs with Christ. So in the Roman culture is that whenever a, somebody is adopted to a family, the, the firstborn son always get two-thirds of what's 
due to all the inheritance. So the firstborn son always got two-thirds. And then the rest of the kids will have to split the rest of the inheritance. But this is saying that God's firstborn son, Christ, he's going to relinquish the two-thirds. And now you and I are going to be co-heirs with Christ. Meaning this, that whatever is due to Christ is now due to you. That is scandalous. That does not make sense. What do you mean, God? I, I, like, give God, like, the good stuff. Like, give Christ, like, the good stuff. I mean, he lived a good life. He was perfect. He went to the cross. He died. Like, give him, like, the good stuff, God. I'll be good with, like, the, the lesser stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll be good with the golden streets. Let's give him the big mansion house. Like, just give me the golden streets, and you give him the mansion. No, no, no. God says, no, no, no. You get whatever is due to Christ. Now, that is different. And so what that does is that that changes your mindset. See, most of us, we live as orphans, not as child of God. Because when you live as an orphan, you say, I'm not worthy of stuff. But when you live as a son, you say, I'm deserving of this. When you live as an orphan, you say, oh, I'm just going to struggle through life. I'm going to just mamby-pamby through life. And whatever deck of cards I get, that's what I'm going to accept. Oh, woe well, is me. You know, just teeter-totter through life. And God says, no, 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 no. That's not our mindset now. Because we are co-heirs with Christ. This is why we should get the best. We should work for the best. We should believe God for the best. Here's why. Because we get what Christ gets. And he deserves the best. So guess what? You deserve the best. And he gets God's best stuff. So guess what? You get God's best stuff. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 17, we are now co-heirs with Christ. You see, I believe this. There's a massive difference between living as a child of God and living as an orphan of God. You see, when you're a child of God, you're sitting. It's just like a place of rest. But when you are an orphan, you are striving. Some of you, you're tired in life from striving. You're just, you're just going and going and going at it. When you are a child of God, you are trusting in him. But when you are an orphan, you're trying to get his approval. You see, when you are a child of God, you were, you were receiving of who he is and his spirit of God. But when you're an orphan, you're achieving. You're trying to achieve and get his grace. But when you are a child of God, you are living from a place of fruitfulness. But when you're an orphan, you're living from a place of frustration. And lastly, when you are a child of God, you are living from God. But when you are an orphan, you're living for God. You're trying to get him to say to you, I want you in my house. No, 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 no. Guess what? Can I tell you right now? It doesn't matter how many times you make mistakes. No matter, no matter who you are and what your past looks like, when you make the commitment, I am willing for this adoption, it was sealed. It was sealed. When the judge made this sound, it was sealed that you no longer have to strive anymore. You now can live from a place of acceptance, knowing that your God is for you and knowing that you are a child of God. You have been adopted into this family. Now, I am not really familiar with adoption, but I remember something close to it. Years ago, I had a, a we, Brittany and I, we're foster parents, and we had an opportunity to have two amazing boys in our family. Uh, and they were just, um, they were amazing. And they were two years of age. They were twin boys, and they had a lot of energy. I, I tell you, it was a lot of energy. And we have two. We had two little girls at that point, and um, huh, it was uh, it was a lot. I remember this just, uh, just the whole process because in a foster care world, it's, sometimes the placement to houses is real quick. And so what they would do is that they would put the clothes in the trash bag, right? And it was almost like you have to bring these clothes and it would smell like the previous environment and all that stuff. So we had to wash it and all that stuff. It was just a lot in the process with the trash bag. 
And I remember just the nights having these boards. We had poop all over our walls. They would get up in the middle of the night. They're around two years old. And they would get up in the middle of the night and put poop all over our walls, all over our carpet. And can I tell you, it was a nasty process. And uh, I remember just because of their trauma, our entire upstairs smelled really bad. And guess what? I was so okay with the smell. Here's why. Because I felt called by God to love those boys for that season. Can I tell you, God is okay with your baggage. He's okay with your smell. He's okay with your drama. He's okay with your letdowns. He's okay with your problems of your past. He's okay with your addiction. He says, come on to my house. If you are willing, you can come into my house. Here's why. Because the deal is done. He wants your problems. He wants your drama. He wants it all. He wants to tell you right now he's okay with your baggage so the question that we all got to ask ourselves today is what the judge asked the child are you willing that's what he asked all adoptees all kids of God future kids of God are you willing and if you're willing today the judge would simply say, you are now a part of a new family. And that family is with Christ. Amen, somebody. Come on, can we give God a hand clap of praise today? Come on, you can stand to your feet today. Maybe you're here today and uh, you need to be willing. Maybe you're here today and said, you know what? You want to say yes to this. Maybe you want to hear the sound of the judge that says the deal is done. You're now a child of God. And if you walked in here tired, striving, trying, trying to achieve frustration, living for God. God says, change it around. Become a son and daughter of God. Live from a place of sitting, trusting, receiving, fruitfulness, and to live from God, not for God today. If you want, would you all close your eyes right now? Maybe you're here today and you want to say yes to God. Maybe you want to say yes, that you are willing to become a son. That's you. You don't need to raise your hand. This is an inward decision that you got to make in your own heart. In fact, after the service, you can come to the front of the altar. We want to give you a Bible and resources and all the stuff you need so that you can walk with God and make this journey with God. Make that decision in your heart right now. It's in your own heart. Make that decision. I want to become a son and daughter of God. I want to be adopted into the family of God. I'm going to leave my old family behind, my old ways behind, and walk into the new ways of God. Would you all repeat this prayer to me? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for the cross. It paid the ransom so that I can be adopted into the family of God. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give God a hand clap of praise today.